Thank you all for coming to Games and Grub 101, how to open and run a board game cafe. Um, so to begin, I'll just explain who we are and why we feel like we can sit up here and talk to you about this stuff. Uh, my name's Jess. Um, I work at The Board and Brew, a board game cafe in College Park, Maryland. Um, I've worked there for, uh, I think it's the five years now. Um, I've been everything from server, barista, game guru, uh, up through management, uh, and now I kind of, I do like the back end financial managing and human resources managing now. All right, I'm um, Kenny. I also work at the Board and Brew. If you kind of hadn't figured it out, we all have either worked at the Board and Brew or currently work there right now. Um, I am one of the managers who's there pretty much every day, just making sure everything goes smoothly. And I've been there for about three years. You do board game stuff. I do most of the board game stuff as well. I'm Arden. I previously worked at the Board and Brew. I was there for a few years doing everything from working as a server, a game guru, a barista, and a supervisor. You were also a cook for a bit. Oh, yeah, I also did work as a cook. <laughs> <laughs> you did every week. Ten whole minutes. Uh, I'm Brian, and I'm one of the founders of the Board and Brew. I've been working there. All of it. <laughs> All, All of it. it. <laughs> uh, which we're, we've been open a little over five and a half years now. Um, and I'm David, a former server and barista, also at the Board and Brew in general, just board game enthusiast. I'm Mag here. Magic Boy. Yeah. Oh, yeah, and I ran Magic. Uh, I was the tournament organizer for the Board and Brew's Magic Night uh, for probably about eight months or so. Solid chunk of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh, and like we said, we've been open for five and a half years. We are about to open up our second location in Philadelphia. Very Board and Brew 2. Uh, Within a month. Hopefully, Please. question mark. <laughs> By the end of January. <laughs> yes. So first off, y'all know what a board game cafe is, right? Show of hands. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there are some who don't. Okay. So a board game cafe is a business that combines a game store, a board game library, and a food service establishment to like varying degrees. Uh, usually it's a place where you can play games in a shared space, eat food, and attend like gaming events if that's the kind of thing your local board game cafe might do. We, in particular, do. Um, so a lot of people, when they're thinking about opening a board game cafe, it's because they really enjoy playing board games. Um, but the thing is, uh, a board game cafe is mostly a restaurant most of the time. So if you don't want to own and open a restaurant, opening a board game cafe might not be for you. Um, it requires a lot of upfront investment, like half a million to a million dollars. Um, and you need to be able to not only collect that investment from both private investors and banks, but you have to also be able to pay it back afterward um, and get return on investment for your investors. Um, and that can be challenging because running and opening a restaurant is already a pretty unpredictable vis business venture. A lot of restaurants fail within the first couple of years and you've added on an additional factor of instability and unpredictability and a strange niche in your community. Um, so it is challenging, it's hard work. If you've ever talked to a restaurant owner, you know that it is a really stressful job. Um, and again, it is more stress on top of that. <laughs> Additionally, banks already don't like loaning money to restaurants because as I mentioned, many of them fail. Um, so they don't always consider that a super reliable loan. You are now going to a bank and telling them, I would like to open a restaurant, but also it's a board game cafe and the bank is probably not gonna know what that is or if they do, they know that that's an even weirder thing to open and an even riskier venture. Brian can do his. <laughs> yeah, uh, so when we went for our loans, I think it was the eighth bank that we spoke to who gave us a loan, and I think it was nine months of back and forth with our business model and everything to, to actually get the loan in place. So it was not easy getting money from a bank for us. <laughs> and they do not know what Board Game Cafe is. <laughs> yeah. You mean like Monopoly? <laughs> So when you open a board game cafe, you kind of you have to decide what your primary focus is. Uh, you need to decide where you want to fall between a retail game store and a full service restaurant. Uh, your focus should influence your business decisions and your own needs, and your revenue expectations could, should kind of match that focus. So like if you want to be more focused on the board game aspect of it, you want your board game sales to drive a lot of your revenue. Uh, if you want to be a restaurant that happens to have games, there's places like The Boardroom in DC, which is a bar that happens to have a few like worn out board games that you can play for free, but those aren't part of their revenue, their business model, uh, so it's less important to them. Uh, you can have like 
A few, you know, we put a lot of focus into maintaining our board game library. Like over time, we have the game charge that they'll talk about in a minute. Uh, but if you just want to be like a game store that happens to have food, you could have like pre-made, you know, sandwiches coming from somewhere else that you just happen to get at your place, and you focus more on the board game aspect of it than the uh, the actual restaurant aspect. Uh, we fall somewhere in the middle. We have a good solid library that we maintain over time, uh, but we also put a lot of effort into maintaining the quality of the food we actually serve. We're pretty high on the restaurant end. Yeah, especially because. Um if you don't, if you can't guarantee that everyone who's going to come into your uh, business wants to play board games, you should have other offerings for people who don't want to play games because that dramatically increases your customer base. So if you have a good functioning restaurant and you have good coffee, then students can come in and study or people can come in for meals with their families um, and they don't have to pay attention to games at all. Um, so you can get a lot more revenue that way. Yeah, and just to add on to that, so uh, when you're running a business and you're paying rent, you're paying for every hour of the day. Uh, part of our business model was to set ourselves up as a place that was a coffee shop in the morning. Um, we do food through lunch and dinner and have drinks at night, have gaming at night. One of the goals was to have about the widest range of hours that we could. Um, and that really, f from our standpoint makes it so that you do have to cater to people who are not coming in to play games. At 8 a.m. in the morning on a weekday, 0% of the people coming in are playing games. Friday, Saturday night, every table might have a game on it, and that's great. Um, but I don't think that we would be able to just cater to uh, one type of customer and really hit the mark. So. All right, so I'm going to talk a I talk a bit about some business considerations. Um, now these are just considerations to have honestly when opening any type of business and definitely when opening restaurants, um, but I'm going to kind of focus on how they interact with um, a board game cafe specifically. Um, so the first one uh, would be location. Um, you just, you want it to be in a good location. Uh, generally foot traffic is good, high foot traffic is nice, but uh, it's just good and everyone wants it, so your rent is going to be higher if you end up getting that. Um, the other thing that would be nice is parking. That is one thing that we don't have, and it is not make or break, but it would definitely be nice. Um, so because you're a game cafe instead of just a restaurant, normally restaurants have a, like a desired table turnover time, and it's like between 30 minutes and 45 minutes generally. Um, that you can get someone seated, get them fed, have them pay, check out, and get them out the door, and get someone else in their place. That is not something you can like regularly rely on for a board game cafe, because you want people in there playing long format games, you know? You want people to have a good time. Um, and with that, you need a bigger space on the inside, and also, ideally, more parking on the outside, because uh, you're just gonna need to have more people in constantly instead of having people like leaving and pe other people replacing them. Uh, and with location comes like demographics in the area. Um, it's hard to start a gaming community in a place where there isn't already one. Board games uh, are kind of a hard sell sometimes. Um, and it's definitely a hard sell the moment you open. You know, you want customers, you want customers from your grand opening on and on until forever, and we've definitely created a community where we are, but if we didn't have like board game fans, actually I think Arden and Kenny both started as just nerds who liked board games, and when they heard a board game cafe was opening, were like, oh, let me check that out. Yeah, I like wandered in off the street on the first day the restaurant was open, um, and came up and talked to Brian about board games for like half an hour to an hour, and then just did not stop coming until they hired me. <laughs> um, but so like you kind of want to be in a place where there is that kind of community. You have people that want you to be there and that want to experience what you have to offer. Um, yeah, the first store is in College Park, so college campus. Yeah, college campus is super, super nice. That is what we uh, ended up sticking with. Our second location is also on a college campus or just off a of college campus. Um, but being in uh, like board games are cool. First of all, I don't know if you guys know that, 
but college kids also pretty cool sometimes. So uh, uh, they are a good group of people that need a place to go and hang out, that want to gather. There's a, they need to study, you know, they need to caffeinate. Um, and so we've had really, really good luck there. Um, the next piece would be competition. So usually restaurants and cafes, you can't over dilute them, you know, every, just, just think about how many Starbucks's there are in one mall or in like one small town. Everyone needs to eat, most people need to caffeinate, um, and so you don't really have to worry that much if you're opening a restaurant down the street from another restaurant. Um, board game shops and comic book stores are not the same. Um, generally, uh, when you have, like board game shops and comic book stores will have their like very, very loyal fans, you know? Like, I have my shop that I go to. Um, and so when, you're go when you open up in a town, or if there are, say, two sh stores in a town, you're splitting the community, basically. And maybe they'll, like, come and check you out, but it's, uh, you're definitely diluting the people that can come out to you. Um, so I would say if, if you're not, if you're trying to open next to another board game cafe, I would urge you not to or you're gonna have to be really good, you know? You have to make, do something to make yourself stand out. Uh, and one thing you could do is clear identity uh, through branding. Um, so like, you need to have a name and maybe a logo that screams Board Game Cafe. Because when you see a restaurant, you can usually tell by the name that it's a restaurant. Maybe it says pizzeria or maybe it says something. There are some like, pull words and like, food imagery that you see and you automatically know what you're getting into. Um, and so you want to do that with board games. You want to have something that says board games in the title or if not in the title is pretty obvious. Um, and you want your logo to also screen board games. We have the best one. I'm sorry. We won. We beat everyone to it. You cannot have that one. <laughs> no? Sorry. <laughs> well, just trust us. <laughs> it's a, it's a it's a dice that is also. I need to talk to the microphone. It is a dice that is also a, a mug. mug. That's very cool. Yeah. Nice. Cool. Everybody see. <laughs> there we go. There, there we go. Is. That's our logo. That's the monochrome version. Yes. It now has color. <laughs> always had color. Always I had just color. have Glossy different versions for tiger. different things. So, just a little bit to touch on the demographics <clears throat> in competition and what went into uh, College Park. So I and the other owner who, um, excuse me, I and the other owner who uh, founded this, both were from College Park. We were students at the University of Maryland. We were pretty familiar with the area. Um, I would say a familiarity with the market that you're getting into is important. Um, College Park, has surprisingly little entertainment in the area. There are bars and some other bars, <laughs> and that is it. There's a bowling alley. Which is also a bar, actually. Which is yeah. also a yeah. bar. Yeah. That, that, that one's also a bar. There is a liquor store that is also a bar. <laughs> yes. So anyhow, uh, sh the short of it is that there's no, there's really no entertainment to compete with there, and that was a huge uh, benefit to us. There's also, at the time when we opened, there was no specialty coffee in College Park. Um, to the point that, that Jess made uh, specialty coffee opened 200 feet from our front door, and I don't think it really strongly impacted our coffee sales. Um, they're doing well, we're doing well. As she said, there's a lot of people that drink coffee. Um, but really making sure that You've got a large population looking for something to do. Hits entertainment. Um, and we chose a college campus, so college students, I think, are a great demographic for us. But I would say young professionals are also a great demographic. Um, board games have a pretty wide appeal uh, if you get people in to start them. Some people are more aware of board games going into it than others. Um, some other demographics that we could have chosen uh, would be like high school students and families with kids. We do sometimes get families with kids in on our, uh, on our weekends during the day. Um, but I think it would be a little bit of a different business model if you're going for those as your primary market. Um, one day we hope to go into suburbia and tackle that whole beast, but location two 
you really want to replicate location one. It is not time to take risks on targeting a new, new demographic. So we're just kind of hitting the college campus for now. Yeah, it's, it's actually the same apartment uh, owners. It's the same landlord, yeah. yeah. <laughs> for both locations. Uh, all right, so now we're going to talk about the specifics of the game aspect of the business for a little bit. Um, when we opened, I think we started with about 500 games, um, according to Brian, uh, which put us back roughly $10,000 um, at the time, I think pretty good. So if you're setting up a location, you're going to probably have a wholesale account with game sellers. Um, and at the time, the average game in the library, I think 20 was a pretty good number. Uh, 500 gets you to 10,000. Now I would say it's going up maybe to about mm -hmm. 25. There are certainly lots of games that are going to be over that, even at wholesale price. I mean, we get those games that cost 100 retail, and we're not getting them for $25. <laughs> uh, but Uno offsets that. <laughs> so there's, there's averages, right? So. so we started with 500. We currently have. Uh, very close to 800 in our College Park location. Uh, we've been adding pretty slowly over time. Usually, uh, you know, order new games if, if, like once a month. We'll get three or four in, and then we'll just add that onto the shelf. Uh, the current estimated value, though, of our library. Hold on, I have a spreadsheet. So it's about 16. 16. Yeah, assuming we could buy everything at the price we originally bought it, which is not possible for. You know, half of our games, which are out of print, but uh, is 16700 So that's the approximate value of, of our board game library right now. Uh, so we um, started off with the 500 games, and we had them organized sort of alphabetically, which sounds nice, but it's kind of if you don't know what you're looking for and you and you walk in and you just see a, a big wall of board games, uh, it's not very helpful if you're if you're not already a fan or if nobody's there to help you, which sometimes we have game gurus on shift whose job is just to teach people board games and to help people out, but uh, we can't afford that every second of every day. Um, they're mainly there on weekends and most weekday nights. Uh, we have somebody around, but uh, if you come in and don't have that there, the alphabetical system just wasn't working out because you're kind of like randomly pulling boxes off the shelf. Uh, so about two years ago, three years ago, when did we switch over? I'm not sure. Maybe two, three, uh, two we, years. We changed our categoriz categorization method. Uh, we kind of put everything into different genres and then sorted them out that way. So it's it's kind of loose, mainly based on the mechanic in the game. So we have a card drafting section, we have a deck building section. Uh, that way if you know like Dominion and you played Dominion, uh, you can just look at the games around Dominion and be like, oh hey, this is probably something similar, I can get into that. Uh, whereas before it was kind of, I know Dominion and this game next to it starts with a D, uh, maybe it's good. <laughs> or you're just guessing based on the art, which sometimes works out. Uh, so we did that. We have like 20 categories for games right now, and we're trying to change them up. There's been like a million roll and writes that came out the past year, so we've had to add that section in. Uh, we've kind of gotten rid of a few. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Storytelling games. I think yeah. we're trying to cut out Quest. I don't know. Yeah. We have, but we have 24 categories, and within each category, it's alphabetized so that it's still somewhat easy for people to find. There's plenty of arguments that start about oh, well, is, should this be in the deck building section or is it uh, <laughs> drafting? And for many games it's clear, for many games it's not, but still I'll take the good with the bad. Uh, it's much better to have some kind of organization to it. And the nice thing about that too is that in those sections it doesn't just say here are the drafting games. It says drafting, this is vaguely what a drafting game is. If you've played a game like this, then you like drafting games. And if you need recommendations, here's a couple recommended titles. So the shelves can kind of guide players when, like Kenny said, we can't afford to have a game guru on staff. Or the game guru is busy helping someone else. Yeah, that's another thing. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if anybody was at the panel yesterday, but 
Hmm? You, oh, you were busy helping someone else? Hmm? No, no. I mean, I mean, just teaching games takes a little bit of yes, time, so definitely. you can't have everybody helped at the same time uh, if there's only one game guru on. The main way uh, sort of we afford the gurus, I guess, uh, we and do, the and the new games, and the replacing of the old games, uh, which doesn't happen too, too often. We honestly don't get many games that are you know, played beyond repair. Uh, probably like one or two every couple of months. I know Splendor and, and Monopoly and Dixit we have to replace pretty frequently, but that's about it. Um, the way we cover all of that, we do charge a $5 fee uh, for anybody playing games in the store. Uh, that is, for unlimited gaming, you can stay as long as you want to play as many games as you'd like, uh, but that's for everybody at the table. If you're just coming in to like, eat food, we don't charge you, but if you're here to game, uh, $5 generally, nobody has a problem with it. It's a pretty fair price. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's always people who complain. There are lots of people that think gaming should be free if they're eating there. Um, so uh, we put a lot of thought into our game fees, and they do cover, so they cover new games. They cover game guru costs. Um, but they also have to cover this sort of nebulous thing, which is uh, table turnover time. So how much business are you missing out on because people are staying twice as long so they can play a game. You're never going to be able to measure it, but it is certainly a cost to have people stay there a long time. And it's part of the things, it's also something we want them to do, so it's a cost that we want to be able to afford. Um, when we were thinking about what to do with the game fee, we considered an hourly fee, because that seems to make sense when you're, when you're trying to cover the extra time they're spending there. Um, but hourly fees come off wrong in a game cafe, in my opinion. If you're playing uh, an excellent game, you're playing a game and you're getting close to the end and you have five minutes left in the hour that you paid for, and everybody's like, oh, well, maybe we should wrap this up so we don't have to pay for another hour or maybe they'll just let it slide if we go over 10 minutes. Then you have all sorts of conversations with servers saying, no, no, you guys were here for two hours. We got to charge you for two hours. You don't want to argue with your customers. You don't want to have people rush out. You don't want to have people abandon their game because they don't want to pay an extra however much per person. Um, so I feel pretty strongly that, that a flat fee is the way to go. Now, the amount that is correct is is tough um, it's really there's a lot about perception and you don't know the cost of what you're trying to cover because it's so hard to measure um, and that's something you kind of have to feel out for yourself what what feels comfortable what sounds good what's not going to scare people away um, and is still going to cover some of the cost uh, well, we're going to take a bunch of questions at the end which, 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 uh, just a which, which, oh, which is yeah, red button now. Say, yeah, so. is yeah. right now. It's now. All right, Surprise. questions. Thank you for <laughs> Go for it. Um, uh, it sounds like you don't track which games are being played. Uh, this is the uh, I would love to. We don't. It's I, so I have a computer science background, and I have a lot of dreams of things that we would do. I would love to have QR codes that people could scan and have an app. <laughs> So that, like, maybe at some point we'll have a board and brew app, and they can scan what games they're playing, record their scores. That would be awesome. So, so let me ask a leading but, question: Do you think that would help you figure out which games are a problem for your business, or which games can be replaced? I don't think it would help us out too much. Um, we have a general idea of what sorts of games people like to play the most. You get an idea walking around on the floor, having the game gurus who are recommending and teaching games. Um, the harder question is things like uh, Twilight Imperium 4. We have it, and people recognize that from the gaming community. You know, oh my god, they have this, or they have that, and they have these long games, and that's been played maybe three times, <laughs> right? I don't think anybody but finished it. I would still... No, uh, I uh, we've. Yeah, people fin have finished games of that, started and finished. Oh my God. Um, I wouldn't take it out of the library. <laughs> um, yeah, there are but games it does that get a little harder. Going to get played 
that we just have because they're cool to have. <laughs> Sometimes it's a set piece. Looks good. Yeah, and the other thing is um, the staff has their hands physically on the games a lot of the time because um, we encourage customers not to shelf their own games because now that we've got this great system, although everything's color-coded, so you could see, oh, this has the drafting stripe on it and I know where that goes so I can put it up there. Um, having staff put them away, uh, we found just keeps things a lot more coordinated. So you can then see which boxes physically have a lot of wear and tear as you shelve them. People can get a sense for what boxes they're shelving regularly. So it's not like the customers are the only ones who interact with the physical game. And, and I guess another thing to your point, if I could magically have access to that information, yes, I would want it and I would use it. Um, the question is really, would I get enough out of it to justify the expense of collecting it, right? Um, and at some point, again, if we have multiple locations or something, then something that's app-based, that, that, that might make sense when you're getting the benefit from multiple places. But it was never very high on our priority list for a single spot. We always have other fires to put out. <laughs> so is it more of a question of like, how to get that data? Yeah, so uh, efficient ways to collect it um, and then have it in a format that's going to be easy to go through as well. <laughs> right. But then how many hours of labor do you want to pay for for people to take the notepad right. entries right. and put it yeah, into a computer file? It's time it's consuming and expensive. Interns. <laughs> <gasps> Interns. We'll get all the sites. <laughs> yeah, I, but if, but it's, if, it's, it's not, it's not the, uh, the, so that is a quick way to get to the information. That's, that's true. Um, but it, if the value that you're going to get out of any amount of money invested in that doesn't beat your investment, so even if it only costs a hundred dollars, if it doesn't get you a hundred dollars more business, then you there could spend that hundred dollars on uh, on two hundred dollars or something. Else. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that um, type of valuation, I think, is important in all avenues of business, mm -hmm. but especially in independently owned business, because you need to make sure that every dollar that you're spending is a dollar that is well spent and not just spent because it's a project you could do. Yeah. Um, so we should have a question pointer. Oh yeah, we yeah. should. Yeah, Brian, you designate question. Sure. So who, who's up yeah. now? We'll take uh, you guys, right. and then you. I'll get you next. Okay. Um, so as one of the co-founders, can you talk about the split for if you were still working full time or part time? Like, what was the split like? Because it seems like you guys were able to make that transition. Okay. So. <laughs> Funny thing. <laughs> when we started. Um, Part of my requirement was that I would keep my job half time. And I guess we lost a, a manager early on. Um, so the, for the first year and a half or two years, I was working 20 hours at my previous job and 70 hours at the <laughs> restaurant. Oh, once, uh, so leading up to it, I had a full-time job and was doing it all on the side until about two months before we were supposed to open. And then I cut down half-time, but then we had a six-month delay. <laughs> so um, I think it's delays pop up in, in the process of opening these things. That was a particularly bad one, um, but that, is, that can certainly be tricky. And I would say it depends on how easily you're able to secure funding for this and how much money you have, but really giving up that source of income while your business is not open is a very risky thing to do because when delays pop up, then it just eats into your, your reserves. So my question was about layout when you were considering the customer experience. Is mm -hmm. there a separate section for just gaming or is it a mixture? So it's a mix, um, and I, so okay. So he was asking about the layout of the space when we opened up. Is there a separate area for people who are interested in gaming versus people who are just coming there to eat? Um, and our our first location, well, part of the the ways to save cost on opening um, 
we didn't exactly design our space. <laughs> we inherited a space. Um, so, and it's a little bit different for our first spot and our second spot. So, I would say that there's actually a fair amount of confusion in our first spot because certainly in the morning we're acting much more like a board game cafe. That's what people do for the most part, but we have full service. Lots of people want to order up at the counter and sit down at a table, um, or they're confused if it's seat yourself or just whatever. Uh, there's plenty of confusion. The more uses that you have going on for the space, the harder it is to, for everybody to kind of understand what's going on. Um, and that continues to be an issue for us. It's not the biggest issue, but it, it's certainly something that continues. In our second location, we have a nice divide. It's on two stories. So like the first floor is going to be more of a cafe in the morning and bar at night where it's kind of order up at the counter. Um, and then upstairs is going to be full seating. I wouldn't necessarily separate food and gaming though. And just to clarify on something you said, when you say you inherited the space, as in like you guys bought it from a restaurant that had previously existed there and then yes. still had all yes. of the, not the tables, so, but like the I mean, it was, restaurant it was equipment and the fittings. So there, yeah. was, there was a place where the kitchen was, there was a place where the counter sort of was. Right. Um, and so wasn't it was wasn't already worth it designed. to rebank that. Yeah. We just, right, right. So we, we took over a restaurant that failed and they. Uh, yogurt shop that also failed, merged the two of them. <laughs> knocked down um, walls. Knocked down mm -hmm. a wall, that was the biggest thing that we really did, but like the size of the kitchen um, is problematic for us. We do a lot out of our kitchen and it is tiny. Um, yeah, there's a lot of things that you could do a lot better if you get the opportunity to design your space, but uh, that's also significantly more expensive. Yeah, like, um Fitting a kitchen, if you have to put a kitchen into a different spot than it exists in that location already, or having a location that didn't have a kitchen at all is exorbitantly expensive. Um, so the fact that we were able to have a space that had some of that set up already was a significant savings just on that logistical point, let alone designing the space. Um, but one thing that I think is, is valuable to consider is the idea of having some sort of even small segregated event space that can function like a normal portion of your restaurant in the day to day. Um, but we have tried to host things like open mic nights. We've had people want to do private parties. We've had people do little mini conventions in the restaurant. And when, or when we were doing magic, magic nights yeah. for drafting, mm -hmm. um, if you don't have a specific place for those things, it becomes very nebulous because then you're trying to reserve tables on an open floor. The volume can be a big issue. Um, if you're looking into doing something like an open mic night, soundproofing can be a big issue because then you have to like dampen sound in your entire restaurant or it's super loud for people who don't want to be at open mic night, they just needed to study or whatever they're doing mm -hmm. in the restaurant. Um, so the possibility of having some sort of at least semi-enclosed space um, where you can run all sorts of different events, both board game related and non-game related, um, would be a great thing to consider if you have the cash for it. Mm -hmm. Two part, feel free to pick your favorite part. Uh, <laughs> you mentioned a six month delay right before you opened. Uh, were there any particular takeaways there, like things that you would do differently that came up again, just like less than share? When you get a quote for your general contractor, for your engineer and your architect and all of that, and you are strapped for cash, do not go with the cheapest one. <laughs> um, <laughs> just don't. <laughs> I, yeah, get several quotes and vet the people, you're trusting them with a lot. Do background checks, find other places that they've done, talk to the people who have worked with them, um, otherwise things can happen. Sure. <laughs> Second part, and this is just how do you guys do this amazing thing you do, how do you keep your games clean and all the pieces <laughs> there? Do you have to like, have a gun or? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, I mean. Can't, no. uh, so I think, uh, honestly, I mean, they're not going to be pristine. They're used games. Uh, but we go through and we'll get rid of the truly poor ones. Um, and we've recently started trying to make them stronger before we even put them on the shelves by, yeah. like, sleeving yeah, all the cards, cards. Um, and stuff like that, just trying to help them last longer. Honestly, most yeah. people are just kind of pretty nice. Mm -hmm. And so they do put everything back, and they don't spill drinks on them. Uh, 
and they feel really bad when they do. And so. if they do, they tell you. Which, yeah. Which yeah. you, I, there have been people that have it, which is which Sad. breaks my heart. But it's that's really how you rare. lose a board game. But um, and we also have this uh, mysterious lost pieces cup, <laughs> for which is full lost of yeah. lost pieces from board games because sometimes. Uh, I don't know where they're from. We've got, we've got yeah. 800 board games. I've oh. played some of them, but I don't know what every single piece is. Uh, so that is one of the like side work uh, <laughs> things that game gurus will do is just like pour Figure out all out the lost the pieces, pieces in front of them Stare and be like, this looks glass. like a thing. Um, yeah, yeah. And so, oh, sorry, just really quickly for the new location, we are doing our best to sleeve everything because when it comes to cost, uh, we realized we could also get the sleeves wholesale. It's not that expensive. Uh, it's time intensive. But without that, uh, I've been thoroughly surprised at how well the games hold up. Mm -hmm. I expected to be going through way more replacements, much faster. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I've and been surprised by it. Yeah, I've been surprised by it too. And something that um, has been especially surprising is we didn't originally have um, any sort of liquor licensing. Um, so there was no beer, no wine, no cocktails, even though it had this kind of like nightlife atmosphere. Um, and when we started serving beer and wine, I think there was a concern that if people were going to be um, drinking in the same way that they would drink at a bar, um, that board games that have small components, that have cards, things like the betrayal, um, sliders that are really hard to fit on the cardboard, um, but the thing is, we mostly serve specialty alcohols, so nice craft, craft, beers. craft beers, nice cocktails, alcoholic milkshakes, um, and the price point is reasonable for the quality and also prohibitive for having six beers. <laughs> um, it, it's, it's expensive to have six beers here, um, which is nice because that's not really the vibe that we want mm -hmm. overall. It's just that... College Park has a lot of bars. We didn't need another bar. We needed a nice place to sit and have a beer or two. Um, and it does also mean that when you are playing games, you're going to have a drink or two maybe. Um, and generally, nobody really gets to the point where they're like sloshing drinks on the table. When you go to somewhere like the boardroom that is an actual bar, you can tell why their games are the way that they are because people are having a good time and they're just drunk. Yeah, they're drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I you, I'll get to you next. Yeah. Um, I've I, I worked in kitchens and stuff my whole life. I always kind of had dreams or something like this. Um, but always, like, tabletop role play, Dungeons and Dragons is more of a part of it mm -hmm. uh, than you guys have been stuck. Do you have any ideas or opinions on that? Um, well, we, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Uh, we actually have just started uh, including uh, one of our events during the week is a. a tabletop Tuesday. Tabletop <laughs> Tuesdays. Um, we have someone who works for us who is. I think a great uh, game master. He, he's, he's run been, stuff he's, for us. He's our DM. He's, he's been our DM for a while. Um, and he is super, super into it. Uh, it's very fun. He'll, like every Tuesday, he's there with a campaign he's created in a system that he's excited about in the moment and that people have expressed interest in. And then he'll run something quick and easy, usually, because yeah. it's like two hours maybe. Yeah, longer than it, that. It, I mean, it hasn't really taken off mm. yet. He's got like five or six people come in a week okay. and it's really just him doing it so you can't have too much more than that going mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. uh, but he's looking to train some of the game gurus to be able to handle some of that uh, DM work for him so we're looking into it as a possibility we're not sure how it's going to play out yet and, yeah. Yeah. yeah it's very it's weird and nebulous to staff and, for that um, because there's a lot I mean even if you're just staffing someone to run a game uh, you also realistically should be paying them to prep for the game and that can take uh, yeah that can take more than play time yeah exactly um, and also another issue is that when you're playing with people that you didn't necessarily choose it's hard to put a game together on the fly sort of you know you never really know what the, what uh, your new friends are going to do, what decisions they would be likely to make because you don't know them yet um, and you don't know what they're interested in and what they want, we're going to want to explore. One of the things I'd comment on is that we don't carry a lot of RPG stuff, but we do have a few groups who have been coming pretty regularly playing D&D um, or well, mostly the regular groups are D&D. &D, mm -hmm. but They do Pathfinder and yeah. Okay. Um, I would say that 
for a couple of tables, that's perfectly normal for us. If it were our focus, I think that we would have people at tables a lot longer and just kind of, not that that should be something to shut you down in any way, but the issue of um, table time is going to be bigger for, for, I think, that crowd. Yeah, I think it's also a bit of a smaller crowd um, in the sense that, you know, a lot of my family personally doesn't uh, play tabletop. Um, but I can get them to play a board game with me because it's a lot more accessible. There's not a lot of half hour tabletop games that you can play with your parents when they're in town for your graduation. With David's grandmother. Yeah, with David's <laughs> three grandmothers. Um, so if you're narrowing your niche in an already niche business model, um, that can be challenging unless you know that there's a robust community in your area. Um, and I think when you're thinking about table time too, if you were having people who were coming in to play with new people, they're gonna not only have the table time of playing there, mm. but that means that either somebody, one of your customers is going to have prepped at home to play D&D, &D, um, or they're gonna have to prep on site with you and then also play a whole game, you know, be there for three to six hours plus prep time. Um, it's, it's a long time for anybody to expect to be at a business. It's just far less ideal than a trade yeah. game. Yeah, but I think that you could you could make something that would work. So yeah, yeah like as we were talking about earlier, you kind of have to find your niche on the between game store and food, and I think that is something that I would recommend leaning closer to the game store. But you could always like source food out way that you don't have to put a kitchen in, you don't have to pay someone to be cooking all the time, but you can just have better offerings than like Doritos, <laughs> you know. When you do this, though, uh, you do have to theme it like a sick tavern. Yeah, That's, and you do have to let yeah. us know when it opens. All drinks yeah, yeah. need we to be potions. We will all come. It will be red. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to ask, how do you pick the events that you post and how they affect your business? Gotcha. <laughs> oh, we prepped, we prepped for this slide one. for this one. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, so we've tried a lot of different types of events. Like I said, we've tried open mic night, um, which is challenging. It doesn't work because, um, as Brian mentioned, it's one big space. The whole restaurant is, is open. Um, and so if you don't want to be at open mic, the music is still pretty pervasive. Um, and so that was a bit challenging for us. But we have a super successful trivia night. Um, there's a few um, trivia companies in our area, at least. So we work with one of them. Um, to host trivia, it is always a packed house. People love coming out for that. It's got its own crew of regulars who come in and eat and drink. It's, people love coming out for a beer for trivia. Um, and then we do try and host some more board game focused weekly events. So we have a meetup on Mondays um, for people who want to come and learn new games and make new board gaming friends. And um, we, we have tried a couple things like that and the tabletop night. Um, so it's all about having one, I think, events that are not going to alienate people who aren't participating in them in the moment, um, uh, other than trivia, because that one, everybody yeah. comes to play trivia. Mm -hmm. The whole restaurant is booked with trivia people, pretty much. Um, yeah, the store's full. Keep the, doing it. The store is full, exactly, so there's no reason to not do that. Um, but I think having a setup where if you want to come for that type of gaming, if you want to come for Magic Night on Wednesdays, then you know exactly when to come to find your crew. Um, but if you want to come to the Board and Brew on Wednesdays and study for an exam, you're not going to be unable to do that. Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise, you're going to have to rely on exclusively that customer, excuse me, that customer base to pay your operating costs for that time of that event. That event would have to pay for all of your servers, all of your kitchen staff, all of your food, all of your power for those two hours. So, um, And uh, so like one thing that we, so we have trivia night, um, but because of the, because uh, we're a board game cafe um, and our tables are like we have a dollar figure on our tables basically because of table turnover. We actually keep the game charges over trivia night. Um, like if you want to play trivia, that is a game charge. And that's something we kind of had to figure out and, and realize that we needed to do that simply because people were in and like forcing other people who would be playing games out. Um, and so we kind of had to figure it out. Yeah, there were a lot of trivia teams who would come in and get water and not order food. Mm. And, and play trivia for seats. free. And then leave. And if they win, they also get gift cards to the restaurant. So <laughs> sometimes they stack. And then yeah. And I don't even have a problem with that on an individual table basis. But when you are full and then they're preventing other customers, then it gets a little bit, it gets iffy.
Um, and we do also um, offer uh, private events if somebody wants to make a reservation. Like I mentioned, there's this group that comes in every year for this little mini, I think, a birthday convention, Rathcon. Um, and there are some local biking groups that come in for brunch on their bike routes through the neighborhood. Um, and those things are totally doable, um, especially because in a board game cafe, you do generally have a fair amount of floor space um, mm -hmm. and a fair amount of tables. So having 30 people in one group is a little bit more reasonable than the average restaurant, I would say, maybe. Um, but it can be challenging if you are not a restaurant-focused business to do those sorts of things, unless people have a clear expectation of what they're going to get. Mm -hmm. No question. Uh, my question, since I was thinking about the cleaning, keeping the games clean, do you, is your menu designed to mitigate that in some way? Uh, I no, think we originally were, it was a little bit. Uh, originally, it was a it huge out. concern, especially of mine. I was I was fighting the other. <laughs> influencer Sarah I was like this is gonna destroy everything you can't do a sausage it really sandwich it <laughs> didn't it yeah, really we, doesn't we've been doing I don't know I don't know how I, we, yeah, we, we have wings on the wings. menu <laughs> and, and it's fine and it's, I have not had any problems because so. <laughs> the, the people who are going to come to a board game cafe to play board games especially the heavier board games that have a higher cost attached to them mm -hmm. and more bits that could get grubby um, they care about board games even if they're not theirs and sometimes even more so when it's not theirs like I am much more willing to damage my own possessions than somebody else's even if I've paid to use them um, so if I'm sitting and eating a sandwich at the board and brew and I'm playing a game of theirs I'm gonna be very careful about wiping my hands anytime I touch anything I'm gonna make sure that I wipe the table down so there's no condensation on the table when I put cards down and cardboard down um, and it's not just me doing that basically everybody does that mm -hmm. Yeah. And also, like our servers know that the um, that the games cost things. So, like if you get food dropped off and you're playing games, you're gonna get a stack of napkins. You know, someone will give you a coaster or fake a coaster with a napkin to make sure that you don't uh, just leak a bunch of water all over the games themselves. Yeah, not that it's a uh, it's certainly a very reasonable idea to do everything you can to protect the games, mm -hmm. but. Every step of the way, I've just been surprised at mm -hmm. how much less of an issue that has been than I expected. Yeah, the community wants to help you protect the games, too. <laughs> you next, but there's something in the back. Yeah. Uh, that's you. Not the back. In the middle. In the middle. You. <laughs> you. you. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I'll preface this question by saying that I am a pretty casual Magic the Gathering player. <laughs> Arden, step back. I'm a casual Magic the Gathering oh, player. Yeah, no, you're right. <laughs> It's a very lucrative opportunity, sometimes whether you like it or not. Um, have you guys catered to the Magic the Gathering community or, or not catered to them? Well, I think that we, I think that if we were a retail store, we would cater to them more than we do. Um, I'm happy to try to do events for uh, people who play Magic, but we will never be the kind of space that can do a um, pre-qualifier tournament. We're, we're never going to be able to have large tournaments that set up. Like, yeah, we can't for pre-releases, for pre-releases, yeah, we can't do Friday Night Magic. It's we have to do it on Wednesday. Um, and that means that that actually hurts just even the casual Magic playing. Um, and then for pre-releases, we've been able to do some of those because we do them at midnight and we extend our hours for it. And then if we get a bunch of people in, that's fine. But tournaments in the middle of the day when you're trying to be a restaurant just doesn't happen. Um, I will say that compared to other retail games, retail games have been a pretty small part of our business. Um, Magic is a decent chunk of that. It's, I can definitely see how a retail game store would get a lot of their income from Magic and other players of uh, collectible card game or yeah. ongoing yeah. games. <laughs> so uh, there is there is the space in the restaurant for a lot of sealed products. Like sealed product moves pretty well within the board and brew. Uh, like right in front of the cash wrap, you can have you know boxes there for sale. Uh, but there isn't really the space to do like singles or anything like that. It's something I have thought and talked with Brian about extensively, and it's just not feasible with the space that we have is not out of the question, but maintaining a case of singles takes, like imagine this entire length of table, that's the kind of space you would want to be able to put singles in. Mm -hmm. uh, and dedicating that kind of space in a restaurant 
unless you have some weird situation where like have you ever been to a uh, have you ever been to a diner where they have the little glass case with all the candy <laughs> and stuff in it it's like that uh, it, it's just you would almost have to cater the space to that if you wanted to be able to do more with magic because magic is surprisingly space intensive. It can also be challenging because of all of the people who are going to come and play games and eat at the same time, um, magic players are the least likely to do that. Like they're unlikely to even want water on the table because it's very Value. expensive cardboard in the sleeves. Um, it costs a lot of money and it's your money because it's your cardboard and you own it. Um, and so thinking about having something on the table, especially when you're you know, we have a lot of two-top tables, and so when people are playing matches during drafts, they'll sit at a two-top, and there's not enough room for you to be at the two-top and also for food and drinks to be at the two-top. Um, and it takes a lot of space, because if you're running an eight-person draft, that's all of a sudden, uh, you have to have an eight-person table for everybody to sit in a pod, and then you also have to have four two-top tables available for them to play, or you have to set them up on the same table, on that big long table, and there's not always enough space. Um, so it's a few people who every time they're doing it take up a lot of space um, and really don't enjoy spending money on anything other than magic, which is great if you want to be a magic shop, but when you're thinking about the amount of money that those people are taking away from your restaurant space and other people who are playing games, it can be challenging to think about investing heavily in that. Yeah. Um, I understand the stuff about magic. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, somebody mentioned doing like private parties or birthday parties. Um, how has that worked out for you? And like, what do you usually charge just for like, and then yeah. what do you charge for? Well, so for us, that's a pretty tricky question. We, we work pretty heavily with everybody who wants to do a party. If it's gonna be like 20 people or more, then we work it out with the individual. How much we charge, it depends on how much space you want to block off and do you want to block it off on Monday afternoon or do you want to block it off on Saturday night? Um, the same, same event thrown at a prime time can cost way more. Mm -hmm. um, and so what we do is we, we are not yet at the point where we can have on our website, here's a package, pay this and you get this. Um, we just work with the individual and try to fit what they need and if it's out of their budget, then we try to shift things try around to and keep it, it in yeah. their budget. Yeah. But we'll also we'll also do things like uh, the price would be different if someone if one person wanted to pay for all the food, or if they just wanted to save space and have people buy their own food. Or like we've had people want to do birthday parties and want to make sure that there is a game guru just for their party, um, and so that would of course be a price because we want to make sure the game guru is getting paid. And and if you want a game, that's another thing that you. So it's it's very like. Um, uh, for each party, we have to like tailor a package for it. Yeah. And we. Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. I so, uh, how many of those have you actually done? Some of them on a regular basis. Oh, pretty regular. Yeah. So, certainly more than a couple times a year. Maybe maybe big once big month? ones are. At maybe least once a month, I would say. No, I mean, uh, big ones where they reserve a chunk of the restaurant, and then we charge them ahead of time. That only happens a couple times a year. I don't know. No, I think I think it's couple. once a month. As okay. the person okay. who does the charging of them, <laughs> I think it's about once a month. Uh, we we have one. There was a wedding there. Twice, uh, maybe maybe once yeah, every we'll year or two. There was a wedding reception, not reception, but yeah. Yeah. It was uh, not not a reception, but just a party wedding for party, yeah. uh, everybody yeah. coming in out of town. Yeah. So, um, how does that kind of go with your other normal customers? It hasn't been I mean, we'll a be, we'll problem. We we announce it pretty far in advance. Um, I wouldn't think that we would want to do that too frequently because yeah, if you <laughs> you don't want to piss off your regular customer base just mm -hmm. for an occasional event. Um, but that really hasn't seemed to have been an issue. And then you know sometimes we'll steer people towards when it's going to be least disruptive to everybody. Um. Uh, one more question. Um, Profit-wise, how they usually work out as compared to a normal day if you weren't doing it? We, we balance it. So, like, if it's a party, we'll make sure that whatever we're charging them is going to be function like be what we need it to be. Um, so, like, again, it just depends on what they're looking for. If they're not getting food and we wouldn't have to, like, staff kitchen maybe, if that was something that they didn't need, then maybe we would charge them differently. Um, but it would be all very dependent on... 
and the party and how it's usually it. set up so that it's at least slightly more profitable than regular business because you're turning away a lot of your regular customers. Um, but again, that can be a wide range from if we're closing for three hours on a Monday night to closing in the middle of the day on a Saturday. It's it, it's very different. Thank you. Um, I think you. I was curious about how you do dinner, like full entrees, with the, you know, on the table with the board game and everything. Sure. So for us currently, although we're moving into having a few more entree type meals, we've really stuck to sandwiches and sides, and even, even I mean, we have des we have dessert, we have sides, we have appetizers we have and soup. salads, yeah. but but the entrees are typically just like sandwiches and and sides. Like burgers. Um, but we are we are kind of moving into doing some more entrees. Yeah, people they can't get like a rack of ribs or anything. No, really it hasn't really been an issue. They're good sandwiches, um, and I say this is somebody who has not worked at the restaurant in a long time um, and just comes as a customer. Um, it's really good food. Um, it's something. It's a niche that both obviously game wise and also food wise is not super well filled in our community. Um, having a dedicated full service restaurant that's got good food at a, at a nice price point that isn't a really fancy sit down restaurant but isn't Chipotle or you know a Thai place where somebody will walk over and drop off your plate and then leave. The Applebee's closed actually. Uh, <laughs> We're yeah, really good well, um, but the, the food itself is pretty high quality, and there's a lot, there are lots of people who come in and don't play games. It's not like almost every table, almost all of the dinner times has games on it. There will be times where there is not a single game out, on, even in the evening. Yeah, that, the majority of the people who come to the restaurant are just there for the restaurant. Yeah, because they just enjoy the food, or they enjoy the coffee, or they maybe enjoy the study space. What? It's quieter yeah. than Starbucks. Maybe, maybe you don't like Starbucks. Um, That's how they're the So, the... The fact that something would be suited or not suited to the board game audience is important, but it's not nearly the deciding factor in whether or not I think something winds up on the menu. Okay. Thank you. I think I'm off. <laughs> <laughs> $5. Yeah, and we try to make sure, generally people don't have a problem with it as long as everybody is, you let them know up front and it's clear. Um, and really because, again, even though it's paying for replacements and upkeep and game gurus, the majority of what it's paying for is the table time. Um, and you don't have to be too long-winded about it. You just kind of explain that and say, you're welcome to bring in whatever you want, but there still will be a game fee. And it hasn't been an issue. Mm -hmm. If, on the other hand, you bring that up when they finish their game. That's an issue. That yeah, doesn't go over well. Oh, I was just going to repeat the question if anybody didn't hear it. Oh, okay, cool. Well, I think that's our time anyway. Yeah. You have one last question? Or? No, I guess yeah. Yeah, that's it. Thanks for coming. Thank you, guys. Thank you.